Welcome to the Fence Friday webinar, which is organized by the Fence Committee for a Training, FenceCAT. Uh, the topic of this webinar is the Microbiome Immunity and Neurodevelopment Trialogue from Womb to Adulthood. We have the pleasure today to have three excellent speakers which dedicated their activity to this um, challenge. So it's uh, David McIntyre from uh, UK, Graziela Gradisteanu Perkalaboy from Romania, and Shivan Omahoni from Ireland. Uh, I am moderating this session. My name is Ana Maria Zagran, and I am from Karol Davila University of Medicine and Pharmacy in Bucharest, Romania. Uh, I mentioned that the topic uh, of the webinars are um, um, chosen by uh, your um, uh, topics of preference, uh, which were selected by the ongoing call for ideas. And uh, FENS is trying to offer in this way the best uh, way for uh, um, the best training and funding opportunities. And um, uh, I uh, hope uh, you will uh, check the website, uh, which is presented here. Uh, fence.org uh, slash training, where you can find uh, all the opportunities for training and funding, which uh, FENCE is offering from students and early career. Now, um, I will um, give uh, shortly the uh, um, screen to the three speakers, uh, which will present part of uh, this, uh, this topic. But first of all, I will um, uh, tell you some uh, details uh, about the rules for this webinar. Uh, you can um, uh, write your questions in the Q&A from the chat, uh, so we will be able to uh, respond to them uh, at the end of the presentation. All the webinar will, uh, will last about one hour. Um, and uh, if uh, you have during the talks uh, questions, you also can write them in the uh, in the chat. Um, and uh, I hope you will enjoy uh, this uh, webinar. And I give the um, uh, screen to David to start the first presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ana Maria. Okay. Hopefully, you can all see that now in presentation mode. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited to be uh, kicking off these talks. And I um, just want to thank the organizers for the opp opportunity to present. Look very forward to hearing from Graziella and Siobhan, who we're talking afterwards. So uh, just before I begin, a couple of potential conflicts of interest to disclose. I'm going to be talking a little bit about a technology platform that myself and colleagues have some patents in. And I'm also a scientific advisory board member for Freya Biosciences and Somogen who are working in the microbiome and women's health space. So um, my research team is primarily focused on investigating the role of the maternal microbiome in shaping pregnancy outcomes and early life events. And in particular, we focus our, our studies on the cervical vaginal or lower reproductive tract microbiome. And today what I'm gonna to talk to you about is how we believe that this lower reproductive tract microbiome shapes preterm birth and other adverse, adverse pregnancy outcomes, um, as well as what underpins some of the colonization dynamics and modulation uh, compositionally of this microbiome. And finally, um, how uh, we're starting to assess and understand how microbiota host interactions between uh, different stages of pregnancy might influence these outcomes. Now, hopefully, um, I will also be able to leave you with a clear message that these exposure events to bacteria and other microbes around the time of delivery are very, very important in shaping the early neonatal gut microbiota, which obviously is uh, a critical uh, determinant of health in longer term life. And you'll hear more from my colleagues about that. So to begin with, just a couple of uh, uh, points to make about the reproductive tract microbiome compositionally, what does it look like? Um, we've actually studied this for more than a century. Uh, Dodeline many years ago uh, with his rudimentary microscopy techniques noted that women who are in optimal states of health tend to have in their vaginal secretions high amounts of these uh, rod-shaped bacilli, which we now know as lactobacillus species. And he also noted in his studies of postpartum sepsis that a loss of these species and a transition to other morphotypes of bacteria, uh, which we now recognize as pathogenic bacteria, um, are often associated with a shift towards a, a pathogenic or disease risk. Clinically, this is actually recognized as bacterial vaginosis. 
Now, this has probably led to, I think, what is a bit of a misinterpretation that the cervical vaginal microbiota is a very simple and non-complex niche, which I hopefully will show you that that is indeed not the case. Now, about a decade ago, um, we got a better insight into what compositionally the vaginal uh, microbiome looks like. This is some data from Jacques Ravel and Larry Forney, uh, who performed a large-scale analysis of uh, healthy asymptomatic women. Um, and they were able to show using next generation sequencing of based approaches that uh, the, the vaginal microbiome can be classified into five main groups or, or, or what they termed as community state types. Four of these are dominated by one single lactobacillus species, as, as you can see here. Uh, the highest prevalence types tend to be lactobacillus inners, which is very difficult to culture. So we were unaware of really of its importance in the niche until these sorts of studies uh, started to be undertaken and lactobacillus crispatus, which I'll talk about uh, soon. You'll also note that some healthy asymptomatic women actually don't have lactobacillus species dominance in their profiles, but they often instead are enriched for other lactic acid producing bacteria, which sort of highlights the importance of output, uh, metabolic output of these species in uh, helping to shape health and disease states. Now, I'm gonna focus primarily on lactobacillus species because we do realize and understand that they play a very, very important role in protecting against pathogenic colonization in this niche. They do this via a variety of different methods, um, some of which I've listed here, including uh, modulation of cervical vaginal mucosal viscosity. They themselves are producing antimicrobial compounds. The, their metabolic output, as I mentioned, lactic acid helps lower the pH, which collectively creates a sort of a hostile environment that they're able to thrive in um, and help prevent the colonization by pathogens. Now their dominance for the niche we think is driven largely by an estrogen mediated mechanism whereby estrogen promotes deposition of glycogen and storage of glycogen in the vaginal and cervical epithelial cells. And this can then be broken down primarily by actually host alpha amylase into these complex sugars. And these complex sugars can then be preferentially metabolized by lactobacillus species and utilized as a carbon source, uh, which gives them this competitive advantage in the niche. Uh, as an output lactic acid, is also anti-inflammatory in this niche. Now, consistent with an important role for estrogen in promoting lactobacillus dominance, some of our early work in healthy pregnancy showed that this highly estrogenic state of pregnancy is associated with a strong shift towards predominance of lactobacillus species colonization in pregnancy. At the end of pregnancy, in the postpartum period, we're also the first to show that concurrent with about a 1,000-fold decrease in circulating estrogen concentrations, we see this increase in microbial diversity in the niche, um, which is transient. We know that most women will recover lactobacillus dominance after a certain period of time. So what about in adverse pregnancy outcomes? There's been a lot of work in this area, predominantly using culture and microscopy-based approaches to study uh, bacteria in the niche. But some of these earlier studies performed actually just down the, the hall from where I'm based in Imperial College London, this is at Hammersmith Hospital, um, indicated that the presence of pathogenic bacteria at the time of labor was more prevalent in women suffering from preterm delivery. Bacterial vaginosis was also linked around the same time to increase risk of preterm birth. And culture studies have also identified specific pathogens uh, and, and species that are associated with increased risk. Now, this and other lines of evidence, which I don't have time to talk about today, have led to many people thinking that an ascending vaginal pathogen colonization is probably one of the most common routes of infection uh, leading to preterm birth. Now, this is a very busy slide, but I just want to uh, take a couple of key messages out from this. This is a summary of, of, of the very many uh, molecular-based characterizations that have been done over the last few years in pregnancy, linking vaginal microbiota composition to preterm birth risk. In summary, these have found that a loss of lactobacillus species and an increased diversity, often enrichment of uh, bacterial vaginosis associated species like Gardnerella vaginalis uh, and Atopogon vaginae are associated with an increased risk of preterm birth. And in contrast, dominance of the niche by lactobacillus species, in particular lactobacillus crispatus, in many studies is protective uh, for, against preterm birth. And that type of a relationship um, has been bearing out in recent meta-analyses that have been performed by ourselves and others. Now we think that these in high diversity uh, uh, microbiota compositions that are often enriched by pathogens cause preterm birth via a mechanism as I've described here. This involves recognition of these pathogens by toll-like receptors and nod-like receptors, activation of the host and innate immune response, which then leads to inflammation in these key gestational tissues. 
Now, this inflammation is mediated in part by key transcription factors such as NF-kappa B and activated protein 1, which have multiple roles, including mediating the transcription of key pro-labor and pro-inflammatory and pro-tissue remodeling genes at these different points of the gestational uh, tissues. So their early activation in pregnancy can lead to premature fetal rem membrane remodeling and rupture, which is uh, called preterm pre-labor rupture of the fetal membranes or PPROM, early cervical ripening and activation of contractility in the uterus. And when that happens too soon, we can then have preterm birth as an outcome. Now, of course, prematurity itself is a risk factor for neonatal brain injury, but exposure to a microbial insult and inflammation in utero is also a key uh, uh, part of the pathway leading to neonatal brain injury. Now, um, it's, we can recapitulate that type of a pathway very robustly in various different animal models uh, and in vitro models. And we've done a lot of work in this space uh, as have others, but hard to generate the same type of evidence in humans for various uh, reasons, mo most obvious uh, ethical reasons. But as part of a study that we performed uh, a few years ago, we produced, I think, some of the best in human evidence that a shift towards these high diversity states uh, can lead to a preterm birth phenotype. So this was a study where we investigated the vaginal microbiome uh, in women who are receiving what's called a cervical cyclage. This is a technique which is um, and a procedure performed on women who are identified to be at high risk of preterm birth because they have shortening services, which is detected using ultrasound. It involves putting a suture around the cervix or the neck of the womb that provides, we think, some physical uh, uh, barrier to ascending infection. And there is some evidence that it also helps improve the local immune uh, immunomodulatory state. And the, predominantly this technique is performed using a braided cyclage, as you can see here. And what we showed in this study was that women who receive that braided cyclage have a strong displacement of their lactobacillus species dominance in pregnancy. And we can see that there's a higher prevalence of these women soon after have these high diversity community compositions that we don't see in women who alternatively receive a monofilament cyclage. Now we went on to show that that increase in microbial diversity in the braided patients leads to activation of inflammation. And that inflammation that is associated with early cervical vascularization, which is a proxy for uh, cervical remodeling and ripening, the rate of which is positively correlated with microbial diversity in that niche. This seems to matter for outcomes. As part of a retrospective data set analysis that we did at the time, we observed that outcomes for mothers and babies were much worse in women who had received these braided cyclages, significantly higher rates of non viable pregnancies and preterm birth. I just want to say a couple of quick words as well now on uh, preterm uh, uh, pre labor rupture of the fetal membranes or PPROM. Colloquially, this is described as when a woman's waters break early on in her pregnancy. It precedes about 30 to 40 percent of all preterm birth cases. And there has already been a, a recognition of an increased risk of neonatal sepsis and brain injury uh, following PPROM when vaginal bacteria or pathogenic bacteria are detected at the time of delivery. And that makes sense because you can imagine that when the amniotic sac uh, ruptures too soon, this baby is then going to be exposed to potentially pathogenic bacteria and their products. Because of that, and also this trial uh, in the early 2000s, the primary uh, line of treatment for PPROM in many countries, including all the Commonwealth countries in the UK, is high dose oral erythromycin with the idea being that this will help clear any potential infection and resolve dysbiosis and associated inflammation in these patients. There has been no increasing concern that exposure of, uh, of babies to macrolides like erythromycin in pregnancy can increase their risk of uh, epilepsy and cerebral palsy. And that was, uh, that, that was observed as well in the follow-up to the Oracle study itself. So for us to investigate this, we wanted to look at the microbiome across pregnancy. We did that in a very large population of women. Unfortunately, some of those women went on to experience PPROM, but that enabled us to then look at their microbiome prior to the rupture event itself, where we were able to observe that um, about 30 to 40% of these women have got vaginal dysbiosis or these high diversity compositions prior to rupture. Rupturing of the membranes itself doesn't appear to increase the prevalence of this, we can do different analyses to identify what the sort of bacteria are that we're observing these pathogenic states. And many of you will not be surprised to see some uh, common pathogens here, streptococcus species, including group, group B strep, uh, senethia, uroplasma, so on and so forth. Um, as part of some other work, which I don't have time to talk about, we've done another, another large scale study where we've looked at longitudinal characterization uh, of the microbiome in PPROM and shown that 
this high diversity uh, microbiota tends to emerge in the second trimester. We're not exactly sure why. Currently, we're investigating a couple of different possibilities as to why that might occur. But what we went on to show in this study was that surprisingly, the use of erythromycin was associated with a very strong shift away from lactobacillus uh, dominance and displacement of those communities that, uh, where lactobacillus was detected towards these even higher, more dysbiotic states, often enriched with uh, 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 these pathogenic bacteria. It's not all bad news. We can see that when lactobacillus depletion and high diversity composition uh, is, is actually present prior to the initiation of erythromycin, it actually does a reasonable job in reducing microbial diversity. We've looked a lot into the mechanism as to why we think this happens, and I can discuss this more uh, if time permits uh, at the end of the presentation. Now, this seems to matter for the outcomes for the baby as well, because what we observed was that babies born through this highly dysbiotic microbiota tended to be at higher risk of developing early onset neonatal sepsis. And interestingly, babies who's, uh, who didn't develop sepsis tended to be born through microbial compositions that were enriched for lactobacillus crispatus. In fact, all babies who were born and developed sepsis, uh, none of them were actually born through a, can a canal that had lactobacillus crispatus present in it. So I don't have time to talk about this recent paper that's just come out from our team. This is some work that we've done with Lynn Seitz recently, but I encourage you all to take a look. It's just to point out that we've done now a lot of work looking at, at a patient, individual patient level, specific uh, innate and adaptive immune responses to these different microbial community compositions that I've been talking to you about. And it's highlighted the importance of us from a clinical point of view, having that insight into both microbial composition and specific innate and, and adaptive and inflammatory immune responses to help inform these types of clinical decision-making that we need to uh, during pregnancy. So with that in mind, we've been working on a methodology to try to enable at the bedside rapid diagnosis of microbiota and host inflammatory responses. Um, this has led to the development of what's called direct swab analysis by desorption electrospiry ionization mass spectrometry. It's a bit of a mouthful, I know, DESI MS for short. But this methodology um, very briefly involves beaming a solvent directly onto the swab of a, uh, directly on the surface of a, a clinical swab. This uh, desorbs molecules off the surface, which we take up into a mass spectrometer and in almost real time generate out these complex chemical signatures, which we can then use to diagnose the microbiota composition and the inflammatory state of that sample in less than two minutes. So while I'm showing you this little video to show you what this looks like, this is one of our prototypes on a small portable mass spectrometer and one of the swabs being analyzed. I can tell you as well that we can use it uh, to diagnose uh, very confidently bacterial vaginosis in pregnancy. But more recently, we've shown that these complex chemical profiles that we generate from these swabs can actually enable us to uh, diagnose down to community state level, the vaginal microbiota. We can also use simultaneously these microbial, uh, these chemical signatures to infer the inflammatory state of the sample, which gives us insight into uh, the patient response uh, to that microbiota, which would help in making clinical decision-making uh, in, in various different contexts in pregnancy. So my final slide is just to um, also point out that despite my, uh, my, my focus of this talk being on the maternal outcomes, it's also important to understand that what happens in the vaginal microbiome will probably have an important impact on the development of the neonatal gut microbiome, which as we know is so important in shaping early immune adaption, metabolic programming, uh, extraction of energy, etc. And of course, the neonatal gut is seeded by these bacteria that it's first exposed to. So in the case of vaginal delivery, um, the maternal microbiota. And that's borne out in recent studies that have shown that delivery mode influences the neonatal gut microbiota. And just to finish, this is seemingly important for um, very key uh, early life uh, events, including the risk of childhood asthma development and also allergic sensitization in infancy. So um, I'm going to now uh, stop there. Thank you very much for your attention and thanks to my collaborators and funders. And I pass you over to Graziella who will continue on the exploration now uh, of, of the gut microbiota and its role in shaping uh, in health. Good. Okay, I hope you can see my presentation. Hello, everybody, uh, and thank you for being together with us in such big numbers today. I'm going to start by saying I'm not a neurobiologist. I'm actually a biochemist who fell in love with bacteria very early on in my career. And I have been working in this amazing field of uh, microbiome and, host, and the host immune system and uh, uh, pathogen interaction. And I'm very lucky uh, to say this because we actually live in the microbiome era 
and everywhere we can hear about these microbes and the good things they do for us because they accomplish many functions they can uh, fight off pathogens they synthesize important metabolites um, uh, such as short chain fatty acids and we're going to discuss about those ones quite a lot today and uh, also, they can influence our behaviors through the gut-brain axis, and I'm going to tell you some things about the gut-brain uh, gut axis, which is a bidirectional communication between the gut and the brain. It's actually a very complex equation uh, we are still uh, trying to understand. There are many players involved. We have the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the vagus nerve, which connects the intestine and the brain. We have the neuroendocrine cells, which uh, uh, produce a lot of neurotransmitters, such as serotonin, dopamine, and so on. On. And also bacteria themselves, they can produce various molecules such as um, acetate, for instance, which can serve as a precursor for glutamate, which is again a neurotransmitter, and they can also produce a lot of neurotransmitters which can act uh, locally at the level of the gut. For instance, uh, we have staphylococci, which can produce serotonin and dopamine, bacteroides, which can produce GABA, and uh, also clostridium, which can produce serotonin. And uh, of course, uh, uh, there are uh, diseases uh, um, related to dysfunctions in this gut brain axis. And one example is the uh, inflammatory bowel syndrome, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, sorry. And in the case when we have an inflammatory state, and this is a microbiome signature, let's say, in most of the diseases in an inflammatory state, we have certain things that happen there. We have uh, disrupted the mucosal barrier. We have increased intestinal permeability. We have a loss of short-chain fatty acid producers. And one example is... Um, Fecalibacterium prausnitzi, which produces a lot of butyrate, and butyrate is very important because it actually uh, is a source of nutrients for the colonocytes, so it's important for the homeostasis of the colon. We also have an increased inflammatory species. Uh, one example is the well-known Enterobacteria cheae. We have also increased in immune mediators and then increase in stress hormones. And this is what happens also when we talk about irritable bowel syndrome. These patients have abdominal discomfort. They have uh, uh, visceral hypersensitivity, uh, hypersensitivity, they have alterations in their gut motility. Uh, most of them, they end up developing depression and they have changes in the serotonin levels. And what we are actually doing at University of Bucharest, where I'm um, managing the microbiome sequencing platform, is we look at uh, different ailments and the microbiome signatures in these diseases. And we have, for instance, a recent study that we started now in uh, teenagers with irritable bowel syndrome, and we have have actually three groups we are uh, looking at. We have um, patients with uh, IBS where we see a, an increase in enterobacteria, which is not very good because these are pathobionts and they are bacteria which are associated with inflammation of the intestinal tract. We see low diversity. We can see here that we do not have that many species. And when we talk about microbiome, we are interested in having high diversity because all these microbes, they accomplish different functions. So we, you need to have uh, many of them living uh, happily together. So you as a whole uh, organism, you can be happy as well. Uh, we have also patients who are taking probiotics. And one example is here, a patient taking uh, bifidobacterium uh, probiotic, and you can actually see bifidobacterium as 90% of the microbiome in this example shown here. And we also looked at uh, teenagers with eating disorders, so uh, uh, coupled with IBS. So we have an example here with anorexia and IBS. Here you can see very low diversity of the microbiome. We have also a lot of enterobacteria chae, and again, a lot of uh, bacteria. And you actually see, we see only one species of bacteria is actually taking over the microbiome. So this is one typical example of dysbiosis we see in our patients. What I mostly work on is actually looking at the microbiome changes that occur in metabolic syndrome and diabetes. I'm doing this because in Romania, we have high prevalence of this disease. We are actually placed second in Europe in terms of uh, type 2 diabetes prevalence. I'm not going to go into much detail. Uh, we have some papers published um, about this, but what we see is, again, these typical signatures where we have an increased abundance of enterobacteria chae, and we have loss of beneficial taxa such as Fecalibacterium prausnitzi. But uh, what's interesting and what we again started recently to work on is to look at these patients uh, in a sub-analysis, let's say, because having diabetes is not uh, 
really an easy thing to do because you have to adhere to a strict diet, you have to visit your doctor uh, quite often. So it's really a life-changing disease and you have to learn to live with it. So most of these patients will develop to, ha to have um, depression. And we looked at the microbiota uh, signatures in the case of the patients who only have diabetes and to uh, in comparison to that of those who have also associated depression. And here you see the beta diversity of the microbiome. So each dot uh, represents an individual patient and you can see really there are not uh, big differences when you look at the big picture but what's interesting is that when we look at certain bacterial population that's when we see some differences for instance if we look at the bacteria this abundance we see significantly less in the case of patients with depression and this is important because bacteria produces GABA and GABA levels are decreased in the uh, case of depression again when we look at alistipes we see a significantly increase in case of patients with depression and again this is important because uh, these bacteria are known to consume tryptophan. So if you have more of these ones, uh, they will eat up the tryptophan. So they, the host will have lower levels of tryptophan to convert into serotonin. Uh, what we also saw was a tendency in these patients to have lower enterobacteria chair, which are also producing neurotransmitters, but this um, is not statistically significant because it's a small study we are working on and the, our sample size is not uh, that big at the moment. Um, we also look a lot at the metabolites produced uh, uh, by these microbes because it's not important to know what bacteria are there, but what are they making. So when we look at the metabolites uh, produced by this bacteria, particularly at short chain fatty acids, we see that patients with depression and diabetes have significantly lower levels of butyrate. They also have lower levels of acetate, but butyrate is very important because it influences the release of serotonin from our intestinal enterochromaffin cells. It stimulates memory and synaptic plasticity. And these lower levels of butyrate actually co correlate with lower levels of bacteria which can produce it, such as Clostridium, Butyricococcus, and Fecalibacterium prausnitzi, which are all reduced in the case of patients with depression. We also look at microbiome, so the fungi, which are part of the microbiome, because the microbiome is not just bacteria, there are viruses and fungi there as well. What we see in patients with the diabetes and depression is that they have an increase in both candida and the baryomyces. And this is interesting because we see these signatures also when we look at patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, and generally, when we talk about dysbiosis, and that is a uh, unbalanced microbiome, we see an enrichment of fungi. And also when we looked at aspergillus in this case, we did not find significant differences. So why are we actually doing all this work? Why are we looking at this uh, microbiome signature in all these diseases? Well, we want to know how the microbiome looks like so we know how we can target it and to change it in a way that's beneficial for the patient. And there are multiple ways to target the microbiome. So you can take, um, you can um, eat a diet which is rich in tryptophan, uh, such as eating a lot of turkey or tuna fish, and then the tryptophan will be converted into serotonin. Or you can take prebiotics, and these are uh, nutritional substrates for probiotics, and examples are uh, inulin, for instance, or the famous probiotics. Everybody talks about lactobacilli and bifidobacterium, but they are not the only ones. There are other um, uh, probiotics that can be used as well. Uh, symbiotics are a combination of both pre and probiotics and postbiotics. It's quite a new term that has emerged in the last years, which are molecules produced by these bacteria. And one example are the short chain fatty acids. Antibiotics are given here as an example. Um, of the way we can uh, change the microbiome when we have an infection, of course, uh, we kill off the pathogen, but we also kill off um, uh, beneficial taxa. But for instance, in case of IBX, uh, there are some um, antibiotics which are FDA approved, like uh, rifaximin, which actually was proven to improve the um, symptomatology in these patients. Bacteriophages are viruses of the bacteria, which again, can be used to target uh, certain um, bacteria in the microbiome. One example is again coming from the field of IBD research in case uh, of um, adhering an invasive E. coli, which can be killed off with a um, genetically engineered uh, bacteriophage. 
uh, fecal uh, transplant is again uh, quite well known. It's uh, used uh, for quite some time for treating Clostridium difficile infection, but there are actually ongoing studies looking at uh, its impact on metabolic syndrome, depression, and other diseases as well. Uh, there's a lot of uh, work going on in the nanotechnological field where a lot of uh, uh, researchers are trying to develop uh, nanodrug delivery systems or different nanoparticles, again, to target the microbiome. And of course, we can use bacterial cocktails, which are mixtures of different beneficial bacteria. So you can see there are multiple ways in which we can uh, modify the microbiome. And uh, this is uh, my last uh, you know, slide of the presentation where I'm going to uh, say uh, just to, for you to keep in mind that actually every disease has a certain microbiome signature. I gave you some examples here. In case of uh, IBS, we see increased enterobacteria. In depression, we have lower butyrate levels and lower uh, producers of this uh, important metabolite. Uh, keep in mind there are multiple ways in which we uh, can target the microbiome. And it's this uh, uh, psychobiotic term, which I like really very much how it sounds, which are the type of probiotics uh, which can be uh, used for uh, treatment gut-brain access disorders. And of course, all this work would not have been possible for all the institutions, the medical institutions that uh, provided us with access to the patient and uh, all the colleagues who are involved in this work and the institutions who are providing technical assistance with our experiments. And with this, I wanted to thank you. And of course, uh, I'll be more than happy to answer your questions uh, at the end. And I'm gonna pass on the floor to Siobhan now. Thank you so much. And thanks so much to the organizers for today and really both beautiful talks just before myself as well. So it's great that the three of us are here together. So um, I lead on now to speak about how our microbiome, um, particularly in early life, might be developed in a suboptimal way and maybe associated with pain disorders. So um, I'm based in University College Cork here in Ireland, in the very south of Ireland, and I carry out my research both in my Department of Anatomy and Neuroscience, but also in the world-renowned centre, the APC Microbiome Ireland. So these are just some of my, my ongoing research uh, programmes here in Cork. Um, so I carry out both human and animal research. So I basically look at, at a very basic level, I look at the impact of stressors really on the programming and maintenance of the microbiome gut-brain axis. And today I'm gonna to talk about how this programming is associated with pain disorders. So also some of the, the, the main aims of my research programs really are to define, the ultimate goal I suppose, are to define specific pathways that are most prominent to develop these microbiota targeted interventions then to pave the way for precision interventions. So we, we've heard about the microbiome gut-brain axis and, and got a really good overview of it there. So looking at it from the point of view of pain perception and pain transmission, for some time now it has been known and appreciated that the microbiota within our bowel is associated with visceral sensitivity, particular from the bowel, particularly from the bowel. And this is easy to appreciate, I suppose, because our microbiota is very close to the sensory nerves within our bowel itself. I'll just get my pointer there, and uh, within the bowel itself. But the pathways actually for visceral pain and visceral pain neuroanatomy are very similar to that of somatic pain. So it's the same pathways that are shared between somatic pain and visceral pain. So our microbiota within our bowel produces a number of neurotransmitters, neuropeptides, and also produce a number of immune factors, as such as cytokines, for example. So these, these metabolites that are produced by our microbiome can indirectly impact on pain processing pathways, and they indirectly affect pain processing through the immune system. But they can also directly impact our pain pathways, because some of the neurotransmitters, neuropeptides and cytokines produced by our microbiota within our bowel can actually directly impact on nociceptive receptors within our central nervous system. So looking at, I suppose, the start and the generation of, of our pain pathways, so most of our pain pathways really develop in utero. And a lot of what we need to perceive pain are really present around 25 weeks of gestation. We also see these endogenous ascending inhibitory pathways from the brainstem are not really fully organized or fully developed until mid-infancy. 
This really means that the postnatal period and in infancy a very critical time for the development of our spinal sensory pathways for our somatic pain, but also visceral pain as well. And this leads us to the concept then that both abnormal or excessive activity, potentially due to suboptimal gut microbiome, can lead and change the course of development and cause long-term changes in somatic and also pain processing. So the plasticity of the perinatal nervous system is both a benefit because, of course, it has to be stimulated like other parts of our body, like the immune system, during the postnatal period, potentially by metabolites of a microbiota. But it's also detrimental as well, of course, if we have suboptimal situations occurring in early life. Now, studies have also shown, so probiotic studies, for example, have also shown that certain bacteria, such as lactobacillus, is capable of impacting on systems very closely associated with pain including both the opioid and cannabinoid systems. So here in, in my, uh, my research program in Cork, we model adverse programming of the microbiota gut brain axis for pain in several different ways. So we do this in some ways, such as including non-absorbable antibiotics in early life. And we know antibiotic usage is on the rise, of course, and they are absolutely medically necessary, but maybe we can think about more specific use of them in the future. We also have a germ-free um, uh, suite here in Cork as well. So some of the, some of the work I'll present today is using germ-free mice. And then I also use a model of early life stress as well, incorporating a kind of stress during this very important developmental time window called the stress hyper-responsive period. So starting off, I suppose, with one of the studies we used germ-free animals to define if there was a, a link or an interaction between our gut microbiota and visceral sensitivity. So germ-free animals are born by a C-section and completely devoid of any microorganisms at all. So in this paradigm, and I'll use this paradigm, I'll refer to it as I go through the talk here today. In this paradigm, we stimulate, or we noxiously stimulate the distal colon of the mice using a barostat. And this is referred to as colorectal distension. So it's kind of similar to that kind of bloating feeling at the, at the distal end of the bowel that some of us feel on a day-to-day -day basis, but then other individuals that have sensitive or oversensitivity in the distal end of the bowel will feel pain earlier or have a lower threshold for this type of stimulus. And this experiment, we showed that the germ-free animals in the black boxes here, basically, this is the, the visceral motor responses, which are basically the pain behaviors seen um, during this type of, of paradigm here. So we show that the animals that were completely devoid of any microorganisms had more pain behaviors than those control animals that were fully colonized in a normal fashion in our animal suite. Um, and also as well, what we also did was we colonized our germ-free animals, which is basically just taking them out of the germ-free suite and placing them into the normal animal um, unit, of course. So we show that colonizing germ-free animals was able to reduce or diminish that visceral sensitivity. This again is seen in the threshold, basically. The germ-free animals had a lower threshold to this type of pain stimulus and colonizing the animals with a normal microbiota, normal mouse microbiota, reversed this impact. So looking at this from a, a brain perspective or a, or a central nervous system perspective, we looked at different parts of the brain of these animals post-mortem. They were associated with the affective component of pain. And one of these is the anterior cingular cortex. The anterior cingular cortex really responds to elements that allow interaction or integration of more emotional aspects of pain. We basically measured the volume of the anterior cingular cortex in the prefrontal um, areas of the brain. And you can see here there's a diminished volume in the germ-free animals of this particular area. We also investigated areas of the brainstem associated with the descending pain modulation, and this here is the periaqueductal gray. And in this instance, we saw an increase of this size of this particular brain area in the germ-free animals, indicating that being born germ-free leads to actual differential volume of important areas associated with pain modulation. We went on then to look at the lumbar, the sacral lumbar part of the spinal cord. And this is the part of the spinal cord that's really receiving innervation from the distal area of the colon that we stimulated with this, this paradigm or this colorectal distension paradigm. And here we can see in black that the animals, the germ-free animals that were, had no bacteria at all or any microorganisms at all, had an increase in GFAP, which is a glial marker. And this glial marker has been 
had traditionally shown to be associated with pain and pain perception. And we saw an increase in our germ-free animals while colonizing the animals with a full component of microorganisms reduced this very classical signal or this very classical molecule associated with pain. So moving on then to the concept that early life antibiotic usage might impact on, on pain processes. So in this study, we also wanted to see if there was a different sex differences, basically, because we know that there's a differential effect in humans, at least, and in some rodent models as well, um, between males and females with regard to early life stressors. So in this instance, we administered vancomycin or a cocktail of antibiotics during this very important developmental time window where we see development of all different parts of our microbiota gut brain axis, including our immune system, our central nervous system, but also, of course, our microbiome. So what we noted was at about 11 weeks of age, when we administered again this paradigm, noxious stimulation of the distal end of the colon, and you can see the pain behaviours here we measure in rats, we saw that only male rats were susceptible to early life antibiotics with regard to an increase in their pain responses. Again, we took the distal area of or the end, the lumbar sacred part of the spinal cord, and we analyzed about 50 different targets that are classically associated with pain. And again, this is only seen in males that were susceptible to the pain or to the antibiotics in early life. And we showed that classical pain receptors associated with trip free one, for example, alpha adrenergic two signaling pathways were associated with the pain in males only. Now, this is a model I generated here at Cork a long time ago at this stage, and it's referred to as the maternal separation model. And this is basically where we separate the infant pups during postnatal days 2 to 12 from their mothers for three hours a day. And again, this period is an extremely important developmental time window, both in rats and in humans. In humans, it obviously extends out a little bit longer. Here, we wanted to see if we could actually intervene with a probiotic intervention. So in this instance, we use lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, but instead of just administering the bacteria itself, what we did was we allowed it to grow up and then we extracted soluble mediators, which again were mediators such as short chain fatty acids, neurotransmitters and neuropeptides. And we administered them both to our non-separated control animals and also to our separated stressed group. Now, we've shown before, this is the threshold, basically, we've shown before that maternally separated animals have a lower threshold to this type of stimulus, this noxious stimulus. And this instance, the, the soluble mediators of the lactobacillus were capable of increasing this threshold, so ameliorating the impact of early life stress on the visceral sensitivity pathways. We then, want, we did, then carried out a genome-wide sequencing, and we identified 41 different genes from the entire genome of the maternally separated group that were increased and then decreased by the soluble mediators. And just to maybe simplify this, this diagram a small bit, two of the very important pathways we identified to be increased in our stressed animals and decreased by the intervention of the lactobacillus were associated with classical pain signaling pathways, including the wind signaling pathway, and also respond, responses to the main stress hormone corticosteroid. So this is the study, again, we, we carried out in germ-free animals. And in this instance, again, we showed that the germ-free animals were more sensitive to the visceral, visceral uh, stressed, um, the visceral noxious stimulus. But what we wanted to do was we wanted to assess this in female mice only to determine if there was an impact of estrogen or an impact of cycle stage on the visceral sensitivity seen in these animals. And what we showed was a protective effect of estrogen during the, the pro, so what we did was we did vaginal lavages and we grouped animals both into pro estrus and estrus stages in conventionally colonized animals, and same for germ free. And then we also grouped animals into metaestrus and diestrus stages. And we showed that animals that had higher levels of estrogen had less pain behaviors. So these are the number of pain behaviors basically. So those in the pro estrus and estrus stages, but only the conventionally colonized animals had this protection from the estrogen while animals in the metaestrus and diestrus stage in the conventionally colonized group had higher pain. And both of the groups of the germ-free animals, it didn't matter what stage of the cycle, had an increase in pain responses. And just in maybe, maybe the simplistic diagram to outline um, our data in a little bit easier to view, sometimes rather than loads of graphs, what we did then was we removed the ovaries from our, um, both our conventionally colonized animals and our germ-free animals. 
And we noted was when we extracted the ovaries and removed the actual protective element, the estrogen, those conventionally colonized animals had this increased visceral sensitivity when there was no estrogen present. This was not evident in our germ-free animals, indicating that it didn't matter if estrogen was present or not. These animals had no pain responses uh, that were affected by the estrogen. We went on then to use the conventionally colonized animals and added a pellet of estrogen or estrogen diol um, to these animals. And we found that estrogen replacement in the conventionally colonized animals only decreased their pain. Moving on then to um, some of our human studies, and this was a study we carried out again, looking at sex differences with regard to pain and the microbiome. So we recruited individuals over um, the cycle stage, in the menstrual cycle stage in females, um, so we recruited females over three different stages of, of the menstrual cycle in, in women. And then we only recruited males over uh, one time point. What we did was we took a fecal sample and we also took a blood sample, basically to investigate the entire microbiome gut brain access. I won't go into all of the detail today. We also did a number of neurophysical, neuro neurophysiological assessments where we stimulated the tibial nerve to an extent where we were able to assess somebody's pain threshold and pain sensitivity in both males and females. So we identified that females had a lower uh, pain threshold than males due to the stimulation of the tibial nerve at all stages of the female of the menstrual cycle. What we also importantly noted as well, and won't go through all the microbiome data that we generated, but we also noted very importantly that contraception, we divided our females based on whether they were on the contraceptive uh, pill or not. And we noted that individuals on the contraceptive pill had a different microbiome with regard to certain species of the, of the, the gut microbiome. Importantly as well from my research as well, we've also identified, of course, that stress is very much related to permeability of the gut. We don't want a very permeable gut. We want it to be maintained by these lovely tight junctions and active transport decides what goes in and what goes out. But we noted that individuals, females particularly, on the contraceptive pill had increases in this lipopolysaccharide binding protein, which is an indirect mechanism or an indirect indicator of gut permeability. This study basically gives an impression that it's, it's fantastic to look at differences between males and females, but we do really need to take into account whether individuals are on the contraceptive pill or not. Also, we identified, we did some correlation analysis as well, and we identified correlations only in females, where we saw that sensitivity at the threshold level were associated with Portobello at seven, and females in the luteal phase only had a, in, had a correlation between um, tolerance thresholds to megasphera. So just briefly to, to sum up some of our research and other people's research in this field as well. So there has been extensive, extensive evidence really to show that there are cross-sectional differences in the microbiome that are defined in different disease populations, including in pain-related syndromes. There are a number of rodent models that I defined today as well that also recapitulate some of these human disorders as well. Some of FMT studies in our lab as well have been shown that we can transfer pain syndromes via fecal microbial transplantation as well. Well, we really do have a long way to go with regard to identifying effective therapeutic interventions with regard to reducing pain syndromes in individuals. So with that, I'd like to thank some of the people that were involved in this research and thanks my, to my collaborators and also to the other speakers today and also to the organizers of this fantastic event. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much uh, to all the speakers today. Great presentations on a topic that uh, is amazing and so much uh, important clinically. It will have from now on for sure a great uh, clinical impact, this, uh, this microbiome topic. So we are open now for questions. Uh, we have uh, questions in the Q&A section. Uh, we start with uh, David now. Uh, Theophilus is asking, is there a correlation uh, by va vagina microbiotic composition to factor like overall maternal health and why lactobacillus seems to be more predominant? Thank you for the question. Um, it's a little bit tricky to define what overall maternal health is, but, but let me think about it from another way. Um, there are a number of adverse maternal outcomes that have been correlated quite strongly to, to uh, the vagina microbiota. 
Uh, work by ourselves and others have not only linked preterm birth to an adverse microbiota or a suboptimal microbiota composition, but also miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy. Um, so there's there's a number of sort of um, common uh, uh, adverse outcomes that often are related to one another because they they so have they, they work in this interplay between inflammation activation and the pathology of the disease. So I, I think um, this is this is something that we're, we're learning more and more about. The second part of the question was um, lactobacillus is more, why is it more predominant? Um, I, I think I covered that a little bit in the talk. Uh, just to reiterate, we, we know that um, one of the key things that promotes uh, lactobacillus dominance in this niche is, is an estrogen driven mechanism. Um, in pregnancy, estrogen starts to be present, uh, pr pr uh, produced in huge amounts by the placenta. So as you start to see this big increase around the time of placentation in, in, in sort of around eight to 12 weeks of pregnancy, you start to see glycogen levels increase in the epithelia. And we think that that glycogen then is, and it's broken, broke down products can be utilized by these species and that lets them start to dominate out the niche. And as they're becoming more prevalent in the niche, they're producing more things like lactic acid and other antimicrobial compounds that helps them um, competitively exclude out a lot of these other bacteria. So that's why they tend to be more predominant. Thank you. And also for you, another question from uh, uh, Terence Pang. Great talk, David, regarding offspring health. Have specific maternal microbiome composition been linked to distinct immune susceptibilities uh, of their children, like food allergies versus autoimmune conditions? Um, I don't think quite to that extent. The, the, I think I put at the end of the presentation a very good example of what I think is a fantastic paper from... Um, uh, Susan Lynch's group, I think from UCSF, where they've recently shown the heritability of, of the maternal microbiota, vaginal microbiota in, in, in the neonatal uh, gut microbiota and how that correlates so strongly with subsequent likelihood of developing uh, allergy. And in particular, they're finding similar to the community state types that I talked about, there are certain community compositions that a baby's exposed through during delivery that makes them more or less likely to develop these sorts of allergy uh, symptoms later on in life. And interestingly, I didn't talk about it much, but one of those community state types is one that's dominated by a lactobacillus species called lactobacillus jensenii. And they found that if you um, uh, are exposed to that, that's a very heritable uh, strain or species that, that often will persist in the neonatal gut microbiota and seems to be able to suppress allergic response in the neonate. And they've done some really nice uh, animal studies to show how, how that works mechanistically by modulating you know, immunoglobulin E levels and um, DC cells and things like that. So it's well worth looking into that if you're interested. Thank you. And also um, somebody is asking uh, in terms of emergency C-sections, uh, I believe the exposure of the, the healthy vaginal microbiome would not be possible for the baby. Is there any application which may provide the healthy exposure of the microbiome artificially for the baby? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, and there's a lot of studies on that. So that, that's a sort of uh, question regarding the delivery mode. And you're right that, that by born, being born by a cesarean section means that you're not going to be exposed to that, that um, birth canal. And consistent with that, the microbiota of those babies tends to be, the gut microbiota tends to be more similar to the mother's skin microbiota. That makes sense because the baby's breastfeeding and being exposed to those skin microbiota. Interestingly, cesarean section is strongly associated with development of quite a few different um, disease states and disorders, including obesity and allergy and asthma. Um, and so there's that link between perhaps that lack of exposure is important. That has led to a couple of different options of, of exposure to vaginal microbiota, some which I think some of us are a little bit more or less concerned about, one of which is called vaginal seeding at birth. And this involves taking a gauze and placing it into the mother's vagina um, while she undergoes a cesarean section, essentially. Upon delivery, the baby's then swabbed all over the face uh, and various different orifices with the mother's microbiota. And that does appear to have some uh, impact on the resulting neonatal gut microbiota. Whether or not that is a positive impact in long-term health, uh, I think is yet to be shown, but there are quite a number of trials going on now investigating that in more detail. Um, probiotics, prebiotics are other strategies that a lot of people are investigating. Um, and, and I think it's a little bit unclear really what, what defines the best composition of those probiotics to give to a baby. Depends hugely on what developmental state they are, whether or not they're premature babies, whether or not they're term babies. Um, but there is quite a few different things that are being investigated in that in that sense. Thank you, David. 
Uh, and now for uh, Siobhan, uh, a question, uh, um, please, can we say uh, that the antibiotics effects seen on the pain pathways are side effects common to most drugs depending on the dosage? Yeah, great question. So that's why our first study looked at or used only vancomycin, which is, I suppose, restricted to the gut itself. And I mean, to be fair, we did give a fairly high dose and it was more kind of a proof of concept study to look at kind of, I suppose, harshly obliterating the microbiome in early life. Um, but yes, I mean, many antibiotics have different side effects as well, which should be investigated. So there is a potential for, for you know, more than just the microbiome, obviously, with, with antibiotic usage impacting on pain pathways. Absolutely, I agree with that. Yeah. And also for you, is pain associated uh, with, only with visceral pain or it can cause pain in different areas? From Stella, question. It, uh, is pain associated only with visceral pain? Only with visceral pain or it can cause pain in different areas? I, I'll end, I'm not 100% sure what, what that means, but I'll take it like this. <laughs> that is, is visceral pain associated with comorbid Somatic pain potentially, yes, I, yes, in some instances absolutely is. <laughs> so there are many disorders, for example, one of them being um, fibromyalgia, for example, where we see pain in many different sites of the body. And there are studies now looking at fibromyalgia, uh, sex differences in microbiome as well. But this is a, a disorder, for example, where you see pain at lots of different body sites, including visceral pain and somatic pain, comorbidity. Yep, definitely. Yeah. And somebody is asking you again, what uh, paradigm did you use to assess visceral pain in the rodents? We use colorectal distension. So we use, um, and this is used in humans as well in, in irritable bowel syndrome studies. So we basically used a barostat that defines and controls pressure within, there's a tube basically from the barostat then to a little balloon. Actually, I have a protocol published on, on the internet as well for the entire thing. So the barostat is connected to a tube, connected to a small um, uh, individual sized um, balloon appropriate for the individual, whether it's a human or a, a rodent. And then what happens is you program the barostat to administer a certain pressure of uh, pressure inside that balloon over a time period. So the pressure is pressing on the bowel, but doesn't cause any type of epithelial dysfunction or epithelial um, damage either. So we do investigate whether actual damage is occurring, but it's just the actual pressure on the bowel. So it's colorectal distension, and you can Google literally uh, colorectal distension neuroscience protocols, um, Siobhan and Mahani, for all of the, the details on that as well. Uh, and also for uh, you, Siobhan, uh, do you have any plans to look at microbiome uh, and opioid interactions or effects of opioid withdrawal on visceral hyperalgesia? Yeah, uh, we uh, here in Cork, we don't. Um, there has been some studies I did. I did early on do a study looking at the um, administration of lactobacillus because it was trying, I was trying to replicate another study and see if it would work for my model where a lactobacillus rhamnosus was administered and it was shown to be effective in increasing new opioid receptors. We didn't find any of these differences with regard to lactobacillus species we were administering that were decreasing visceral pain. So we didn't initially see any changes. So we haven't pursued that. My colleagues in the pain center in Galway here in Ireland are working on the cannabinoid and opioid systems as well. So they're kind of progressing that a little bit more than us here. Thank you. Uh, and um, another question also for you, Siobhan, uh, about the separation protocol. Does that affect the maternal stress levels? Does changing cortisol content in milk perhaps uh, any direct affecting the pups? Yeah, great question. Yes, it does stress the moms out um, substantially. And when we put them back together, they actually, we see lots more maternal caregiving from the maternally separated mothers than the non-separated moms when we manage them at the same time during the day. So the mothers are definitely stressed out more. Cortisol is increased in the mothers more. It's increased in the pups more. But studies have shown that it's not necessarily the lack of milk or the quality of the milk that is leading to the changes in the pups long term um, or the offspring long term. Because studies have shown if you have the pups um, separated and during that time period if you stimulate the pups 
uh, as if the mom does, you know, the mom would lick and care, give the pups. So even just stimulating the pups with a little brush to stimulate, stimulate what the mom would do with regards to grooming her pups at that time, it reduces cortisol in the pups and reduces the impact long term in, in. So it's more to do with the caregiving as opposed to the milk, but the milk and the mom's stress are changed as well. But it's more to do with the caregiving. Uh, thank you, Siobhan, and uh, thank you all the attendees that uh, are asking so many questions. Now I will uh, go to Graciela to ask to uh, ask a question from Anissa. Thank you for your uh, for the presentation. Please, uh, people with anorexia sometimes have anxiety and depression. Is it also related to the low level uh, booty rate, just like the case with addiction disorder? Uh, yes, we just started this uh, study on people with anorexia a few months ago, and indeed they have lower beauty rate levels, but uh, more than that I cannot say because we are still working on this and our uh, cohort is quite small. Okay, so thank you. And another uh, uh, question for you, uh, Graciela. People with obesity also have anxiety and depression. What's the effect on microbiota somehow? <laughs> Yeah, we we often like to use the term diabetes because most of the time the patients with type two diabetes that we study are also obese actually in our cohort. So yeah, yeah. but they are some of them are overweight and uh, some are obese, you know, depending on the BMI. So actually, those patients are included in our study, so they have a similar pattern. Okay, and I will take now another question for David. Uh, from Melike. Uh, Dr. Davis, thank you for the presentation. I have a question for you. What about babies with, uh, with being born uh, by C-section? Uh, they don't uh, expose to vaginal microbiota. Uh, if so, is there any approach to transfer vaginal microbiota to babies? I think... Uh, yeah, I think that sounds like the other question. I've probably the, already the, answered the, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's very much related with the other one. Yeah. And uh, George uh, is asking, David, is the DISI mass spec used regularly in microbiome population analysis? And uh, who manufactures the equipment you use? Uh, does it only work with liquid samples? Uh, thanks. It's a great question. We've developed that technology. So it's based off an existing mass spec approach called desorption electrospironization, which is invented by Zoltan Takets, a Hungarian scientist who's one of my main collaborators here in Imperial College. That technology is actually used quite commonly for doing imaging analyses. Um, and mainly the uh, manufacturer who produces that type of setup is, is Waters. We are in the process of trying to commercialize out the direct swab analysis, um, but it can be used, uh, Desi, uh, as, and, and that's just one of many ambient ionization techniques that can be used. There's lasers that we can use as well, um, but it can be used on liquid uh, samples. It can be used on solids. It can be used on a, a wide variety of surfaces. Okay, thank you. Um... Also for Graciela, why people on antipsychotic drugs developing ab abdominal obesity? Thank you. Graciela? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah I, actually, uh, it's quite a new, new field to me, so I, I don't want to say something <laughs> which is not correct. Right. I am I'm take, noting down this question. I'm going to come back uh, with... Uh, with an answer to this because. <laughs> okay, and also it was for you a question in the chat uh, regarding yeah. differences in microbiota uh, caused by diabetes or these changes contribute to the appearance of this illness. Uh, what do you know about it? Yes, the analysis that we did was only shown from for the diabetic patients, which were all sequenced and they had similar patterns of the microbiome as it was shown in the beta diversity analysis. If, you, uh, if you're asking about the, how bad their diabetes was, let's say, we did not find significant correlates, correlations uh, with their uh, clinical parameters that we received like lipid profile or glycated hemoglobin and that. What we saw was uh, an increase in oxidative stress um, and uh, when we measured reactive oxygen species, but I didn't go that much uh, showing that data because, uh, you know, due to the time limit. So that was uh, uh, 
a thing that we saw. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, we maybe have some uh, few minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, there is also another question uh, for you. Obesity, mm -hmm. anxiety, yeah, IBS and many more conditions showed unbalanced microbiome as well as uh, HPA dysfunction. Is there any studies you can recommend to check, to check out? Yes, I can send those uh, by email or? Okay, or... so it's okay. Yeah, yeah they're, they're not that. Uh, I, I that see that I... there are also uh, my, uh, the speakers yeah. answering uh, the question mm -hmm. by writing. Also, it, there is yeah. something for David. I think uh, it's somehow it was uh, answered. Uh, mm -hmm. could be all solved with problems mm -hmm. uh, with lactobacillus, David? <laughs> uh... I don't think so. Um, there's quite a lot of factors that we need to consider when we're thinking about using probiotics in, in the lower reproductive tract in an effective way. What, one of them is that we have a challenge of when we don't have lactobacillus present, instead we have BV associated taxa like Gardnerella vaginalis, they often form a very strong biofilm. And that biofilm is very tricky to displace. That's why a lot of the antibiotics that you use for treating bacterial vaginosis are not very effective. So one strategy is to first of all, try to uh, develop a methodology to penetrate through the biofilm uh, and then potentially a probiotic would be able to be engraft more and be more, more effective um, indeed pre-treatment with antibiotics is some of the strategies that are being used for for probiotics but this field um, particularly for for women's health has been i think um, uh, restricted somewhat to the use of probiotics that have already been used for other applications so um, for example for food uh, production, things that are already FDA approved tend to be commercially uh, more, more um, of interest for the development out of new probiotics. More recently, though, there have been uh, very specific strains um, being used, strains that have been derived uh, from healthy reproductive tract microbiota. Many of the other previous strains that had been used to try to treat bacterial vaginosis and things were being administered orally, meaning that they needed to traverse the gut microbiota before they somehow get into the vagina. Um, alternatively now, more days, more and more, we're seeing the products being delivered directly and administered vaginally. Um, and I think this is suggestive of a much more useful strategy, both administration and, and the effect that we're, we're looking at, so. Thank you. Thank you, David, and thank you all the speakers. It was a great webinar. Uh, I am grateful to you and uh, to fans uh, that uh, allow this uh, to happen and uh, also, I uh, thank all the attendees for uh, uh, for um, coming uh, together with us for uh, for these talks, and I hope that uh, uh, everybody will be aware from now that uh, fans is waiting in the ongoing call for ideas. Uh, your idea for a future training or webinar, because uh, we are searching for uh, uh, ideas that you are interested in. Uh, to organize future uh, neuroscience uh, meetings and trainings. So thank you all. We close here by uh, uh, in this uh, wonderful October afternoon here in, in Bucharest. I hope that um, uh, we will meet again, uh, maybe in a, a fence or meeting. So, and um, with this, uh, thank you all and have a great day ahead. Bye. Thanks, Anna Maria. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.